I have a confession to make. But I think it's safe with you because you are my brothers and sisters in this tribe. I'm a storytelling, story-loving animal. That's it. But it's not really my fault because stories are in the air. They're all around us. And in fact, here in Armenia, Stories are so old, they're written in stone. Stories of antiquity, stories weighted down with history. The first nation state to adopt Christianity. One of the oldest shoe. One of the first people, maybe the second, to learn how to make wine. You have stories so old, they are carved as irrigation maps into boulders that are 5,000 years old. 3,000 meters above sea level, Armenia has stories carved into rocks scattered like jewels across the mountain. Stories of hunting and fighting, celestial constellations and secret symbols. On a recent Saturday morning, I stood on Ukasar Mountain and looked at carvings that some experts say are the earliest depictions of dance in the ancient world. So these are Epic stories, stories of endurance, heroism, survival, and a stubborn insistence on life. It doesn't really surprise me that one of Armenia's entries on the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage List is the epic poem of David of Sassoon. Do you know it? Yeah, it's an epic tale of survival. So, seeds, stories. You have stories that are fertile ground for your imagination, and the seeds that thrive in your stories help define who Armenia is as a nation and help you negotiate your relationship with the world. Seeds in the past turn into seeds for the future. So I want to tell you about a seed from my past. It begins, as seeds often do, with an image, and then it develops into a story. June 6th, 1963, a warm, overcast afternoon on the campus of the State University in San Diego, California. There's a charismatic leader who has arrived to help celebrate the contribution of the state that pioneered equal access to higher education for everyone. I want to share with you his words that day. No country can possibly move ahead. No free society can possibly be sustained unless it has an educated citizenry whose qualities of heart and mind permit it to take part in the complicated and increasingly sophisticated decisions that pour not only upon the President and the Congress, but upon all the citizens who exercise the ultimate power. Now this is the image in the newspapers that day. It's the image in the presidential archives, but there's another more private image. It's the image in my family photo album, and it's the image in my head. There's a man, still young, wearing the black robes of an academic, and he's smiling at a child in his arms. Behind him, row after row of empty chairs marching across this massive sports field. In the distance, a stage nearly empty, a formal podium just abandoned. All around him, other young people in those same black robes with those same optimistic smiles. Out of range of the camera, his parents, neither of whom had the chance to go to college, they are so proud of him. His wife, whose own university studies were interrupted by the child in his arms, but who, 20 years later after raising four children, would go back to finish not one but two degrees. And, in the center of the photo, smiling right back at him, that joyful, curious girl, me. The seed in my family story is not the glamour of having John Kennedy speak at my father's graduation from university. But it's also not the tragedy of his assassination five months later. 
the seed in my family story is the optimism of the message, the call to civic action. Because in my family story, the seed that grew says that education is not only a gift we receive, but it's a responsibility. That I am not investing in my own status or income. That if I receive the gift of an education, I also receive a responsibility to exercise my role as a citizen with courage and conviction and compassion and to make it possible for others to receive that same gift and exercise that same responsibility. So when I wanted to go to graduate school, my grandmother signed over her pension checks to me. Now that I am a professional, I help my nephews attend university. And I fully believe they will do the same for the unborn children who will follow in the next generation because there are seeds we are planting over and over again. As global citizens, we're in the business of making decisions that are a balancing act. We make economic bargains across time, secured by the trust that we build between generations. Now that probably sounds like philosophy or politics to you, but in fact, I think it's a practical aspect of my profession. Development economics is about storytelling. We take the results of seeds we planted in the past, things that we learned, and we invest it for future generations. We tell a data story. We convert facts into narrative and take action. So there's this economist I really like. His name is Tyler Cowen, and he has a great TEDx talk that you should look at. And he really, really dislikes stories. He says that stories are dangerous because they encourage us to reinforce our prior assumptions and our biases. If you're telling yourself a story, he says, you are just telling yourself the same thing over and over again. He says that we are biologically programmed to respond to stories, that they have social power. And he's really concerned that if we listen to or create simple stories, it's like a kind of candy. Okay, I get it. Candy is addictive. Nutritionists would tell us it's made of simple sugars and it's bad for us. I get it. It's a very human thing, this tendency to strip away divergent or conflicting information. We boil things down. We try to impose order on the messy reality of our lives. And in doing so, we impose a pattern on the data rather than extracting one from the data. We make simple sugar. Cognitive dissonance, what's it called? Confirmation bias, oceans of ink have been spilled through thousands of PhD dissertations to remind us of the dangers of oversimplifying. Okay, so here's the thing. Listening to Tyler made me really grumpy. Here's this really bright guy who I really like telling me, a confessed storyteller, that storytelling is bad for me. The fact is I really like candy. Even as I'm here with you, there's a little voice in my head. And the voice is saying, this critique is real. It's valid. Because maybe the reason we love these simple, iconic stories is because we use them to deceive ourselves. In another really great TEDx talk, the amazing Nigerian writer, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie warns us of what she calls the single story. She says that as humans, we are impressionable and we're vulnerable when we listen to stories. And in fact, if we're not careful, the story will define us instead of us defining the story. She's particularly worried about this habit we have of painting over the messy reality of our lives with one color, one brush. At the end of her talk, she says something very wise. She says, when we reject the single story, 
when we realize that there is never a single story about any place, we regain paradise. So let's do it. Let's regain paradise. Let's say no to the single story. Let's turn our back on the past. Not forget the past, but pivot toward the future. Let's think about storytelling as an act of heroic imagination about the possible. Now, I know you're saying this is strange talk from an economist. This woman has undoubtedly had too much candy. And that might be true, but this was precisely the adventure that waited for me in 1999 when I joined a team supporting the leadership of East Timor, where a 24-year war had just ended and the UN-supervised referendum had resulted in independence. So I invite you to travel back in time with me to observe a process of imagining the future. First, see this. A nation of less than a million people, reduced by as much as 25% during the war. Peace restored, but a very uncertain future. 75% of the buildings across the country had been physically destroyed. Very high rates of poverty and malnutrition. The economy was a mess. There were possible prospects from offshore oil but difficult negotiations ahead. And besides, it turns out that oil creates very few jobs and economies that are dependent on extractives are at a high risk of boom and bust and of lapsing back into conflict. Thousands of children had missed out on critical years in school. There were few or no jobs for youth. Before I arrived, a group of Timorese and international agency staff formed what they called the Joint Assessment Mission. They had no hotels, so they slept in tents. They had no restaurants or stores, so they ate military rations out of Ziploc bags. And they held their planning meetings on the steps of the Colonial Palace. Their task was to collect data and develop a plan for reconstruction. I worked on the program they designed, beginning in January 2000. Alongside the reconstructing of schools and repairing of roads, there was a whole different building process going on, a process of imagining what their future, their economy, their country, their nation could be. Put together a bunch of really smart people in a room with a whiteboard, and you get a heated debate on what the structure of the budget should be or how the planning process should work. Put a group of Timorese in a room to talk about their hopes and dreams, and you'll get a story, a vision of the future that they want. Now in that room, one really smart member of the group suggested they use a powerful tool he called the imaginary press release. Imagine it's many years in the future. Maybe it's the 25th anniversary of Timor's independence. All the global news networks, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, Armin News, everybody's there. They're all going to do the big retrospective. What do we want them to say? Not just the beautiful pictures, not just the great numbers. What story do we want them to tell about how we arrived at this wonderful imaginary future? And what do I want my line in that story to be? Now, this was a mixed group. Resistance fighters, community activists, diaspora, old, young, people who had been outside of the country during the conflict, people who had never left their village. An important thing about that group is that most of them had been working for the same cause, Timor, for more than two decades. But they hadn't been working together. So imagine what it felt like finally to be sitting in the same room, around the same circle, imagining the future. There's the commander of the armed resistance during the final years, tears running down his face, talking about how he imagines being able to let go of the losses of the past 
in order to move forward. And right next to him, a community activist half his age, almost in awe of being at the same table as all his legendary heroes. And yet, they're all thinking through the same imaginary future. So now I imagine you're wondering what happened. Well, Timor-Leste made good progress, but the path wasn't smooth. There was nothing magical, not even the imaginary press release. They experienced progress, but then in 2007, violence again. They recovered and restored peace, but uneasy tensions between groups still pose risks. Their economy is advancing, but it is not anywhere as diversified as they would like. But the thing that really matters is that they are still writing their story together, just as they did at the beginning. So it seems to me that for every nation, yours and mine, the critical thing, if we want to enjoy the fruits of these seeds that we are planting, is that we have to construct that future together. It's not enough to have an economic story. We have to construct a shared economic story together. We have to find a way to acknowledge that not everyone has the same tools. Not everyone starts out with the same economic priorities. We have to rejoice in a conversation that rewards curiosity and activism from everyone, no matter how humble, no matter whether they have never been involved before, no matter whether they ever imagined they could be part of that shared economic story. After all, we are all storytelling animals.